Well, we're up to lesson four for unit two, and this is the first day that we're going to take this uh, race car of calculus out for a spin and actually do some uh, some really interesting math. Um, just so you have kind of a heads up on where we're going, the goal today is one of the main two goals of calculus, and that is to be able to take a graph that's curved. It's not straight, right? A, a cur nice curved graph. Pick any point on the graph, like maybe right here, and to be able to find out exactly what the slope of that graph is at that moment. And once you know what the slope of that graph is, which is the, the slope of a tangent line that would just skim by the graph, um, then we might also want to find the equation of that tangent line, right? So that'll be a, another thing that we're kind of shooting for doing today. Uh, now to get there, it's going to take us a minute to get to the point where we can find that perfect slope. Uh, we're going to start off by saying, well, look, let's, um, let's take this easy. How about we pick a couple of points and find the slope between two points, and then eventually the goal is to get to the slope of that red line that only touches in one point. So that purple one is called a secant line, and then the red one is the tangent line. That's ultimately our goal. So we're on this page here, and for today we're going to be doing derivatives at a point. And just so you can kind of uh, keep your notes organized in your mind, uh, we're going to do derivatives again in the next lesson, but the ones today are just at a point. And if you're looking at the little organizer over here on the side, okay, next day you'll see that changes to derivatives just being functions in general. Oops, that uh, kind of went away. There we go. Um, so here we go. Let's give this a shot. We're going to start off again by not getting it perfect. We're not going to try to do the red slope at the beginning, but maybe just this purple one. And let's see if we can uh, find what's called an average rate of change. And when you're doing average rates of change, you're going to be using that purple secant line. Okay, just a line connecting up a couple of points. So uh, a definition for you. As we try to find this average rate of change, well, rate of change, whenever you see that phrase, I want you to think in your mind slope because that's really what it's talking about. So we're going to be trying to do some sort of average slope using this secant line. And the average rate of change, the average slope over an interval is just the amount of change, the amount of change in the y, right, delta y, divided by the length of the interval, divided by the delta x. So yeah, it's just what you know from, you know, math 10. The slope is equal to rise divided by run. That's all it's going to be. And now we're going to try it out with this graph here of x squared plus 1. And we're going to do a few different uh, average rates of change on this question. At the beginning, the first one we're going to do is the average rate of change on the interval 1 to 3. So with these square brackets like that, that's telling you about x values, starting at 1 and then finishing at 3. So I would go up to my graph and I would say, okay, all right, let's find the graph at x equals 1. Well, that's up here. Looks like the y value is 2. And let's also go and find the graph when x is 3. Oh, okay, that's way up there at 10. Now, eventually, just so you know where we're going to go, we're going to try to find the exact slope of this graph at x equals 1. But at the beginning, I don't want to try to get all the way there. I'm just going to do an average slope between those two blue dots that I've got. So I could connect them up, right? And as I do, that particular kind of line is called a secant line. Okay, looking at this point, down here I've got the point 1, and then if I want to know what the y value is, I can kind of see that it's 2, but really what I'm doing is I'm putting 1 into the function, and that function gives me a y value of 2. And then up here I've got the point uh, 3, and then f of 3. So yeah, sure, this number looks like it's a 2, and that number there looks like it's a 10, but I'm just using the function to get there. All right, down here in this box, we can start to actually see what the numbers are. So the very first y value, that f of 1, yeah, that worked out to be a 2. And the second y value, that worked out to be a 10. And if I go to do this grade 10 slope, that's all this average rate of change is, just a nice grade 10 slope between a couple of points. I'm going to take my second y value and subtract off my first. So I'm going to do, I know it's going to be 10 minus 2, I get it. But just to kind of get you into the pattern of how we're going to think. It's f of 3, there's the 10, minus f of 1, that's the 2, all divided by 3 minus 1. And so that ends up being 10 
minus 2 all over 3 minus 1. So I've got an 8 sitting on top of a 2. That looks like 4. So that average rate of change is 4. Now our goal yeah, on the next page, we'll start to see it happen, is to find the exact slope of this graph, maybe at x is equal to 1. And this secant line doesn't look quite right. You know, just looking at the tangent line here, it's probably going to be somewhere in there. So this slope of 4 we've got, it's just too steep. But what if we did an average rate of change a little bit closer? So this next one here says, well, what about the average rate of change from x equals 1 to x equals 2? That's what the square brackets right there mean. Okay, well, great, I see that x is equal to 1. We've used that point already. Next time, let's stop over at x is equal to 2. Well, that'd be right here. Okay, that would be a different, uh, different secant line. That would be something kind of, oops, that was a miss. Let's try that again. It's going to be something kind of like this. It's got a little different slope to it. So if I had to go and find the slope of that green line, that's the average slope, the average rate of change, I would want to find the 2y values and subtract. So I would be going f at 2, the second y value, minus f at 1, all on top of 2 minus 1. Well, f at 2 is a 5. I can see it right off the graph. Or I could substitute it into this function, right? 2 squared plus 1 more is 5. And then f at 1, that was a 2, all sitting on top of 2 minus 1. So I've got a 3 sitting on top of a 1. Oh, okay, that green average rate of change, that green secant line, its slope is a 3. All right, well, let's get even closer. What if you were to go from 1 for x, and we'll barely go down the road, hardly any move at all, just like decimal 0, 0,5, like 1 20th the step over to 2. That would put you like somewhere around there. What if we found that slope? That is getting really close to looking like the tangent line. Yeah, you could find that slope. You would be going f at the second x value. This will allow me to find the second y value. Subtract off f at the first x value. Okay, there's the first y value. All sitting on top of this very small interval. And I tried that out on my calculator, and I ended up getting 2.05. Okay, that's the slope of that pink line. Now, those are average rates of change where you actually have two points on the graph. You have a couple of x values that you know you're working with. You find the y values using the function. And then you do the division, rise divided by run. Our, our objective here is to be able to find the slope of the tangent line. And here's what I'm seeing. As we move that second point in, we started off at 3, then we brought the second point into a 2, and now 1.05. As we move that in, the slope of the secant line is changing, right? The blue line and the green line and the pink line have different slopes. But it is, if I can use the word, it's limiting out to the slope of the tangent line. If I can just keep sliding that point in closer and closer to x equals 1, if that second point gets really close, then I'm going to be able to see what the slope of the tangent line is. In fact, just, just looking at the numbers here at the bottom of the page, if somebody said, well, what do you think the slope of the tangent line is? I'm going to guess 2 because I see that 2.05. But what I'm wondering is how do you get like 2 exactly and not be sitting there going, wow, I think it feels kind of like this. And that's what's called a derivative. And it's one of the two main objectives in calculus is to find this thing, the slope of the tangent line, this derivative at that point. It's also called the instantaneous rate of change. And so now we're going to do this thing for real, right? Not going to be just an average, right? We're going to do this instantaneous slope. And to do that, I'm going to need to use a tangent line to pull that off. So one thing to notice is just the change in the way we talk about this. As we go to do this instantaneous slope, this instantaneous rate of change, right? It's still a rate of change. So when you see that phrase, rate of change, that just means slope every time you see that. But now it's going to be some instantaneous one. We're not actually going to be asking about what the slope is between two points. It's going to be at one point, just a singular point. But to accomplish this, we're going to play around with two points for a while and then limit them together. So what do the words here say? If x equals a, so that's some x value, um, at the location of the point on the curve, then the point's coordinates are a for x, and then, yeah, f of a for the other one. 
Uh, the slope of the curve at this point is this number. What? Okay, all this weird limit thing going on, you know, assuming the limit exists. And Okay, that sounds all pretty technical. Let's just kind of feel how this is working. So there's one point. Okay, this is the one place we're going to do this. Next lesson, we'll see how you can do this more generally so you can save yourself some time. But we're going to try this out at x is equal to 1. So at this point here only, we want to know what the slope is. But our slope finding skills involve using two points. If you try to use the same point twice, you get division by zero if the two x values are the same. We don't want that. So we're going to say, okay, this, this point down here, this is going to be some x value. Maybe x is equal to a, x is equal to 1, whatever you want to call it. And I know yet that, yeah, for this graph, when you put 1 in, you get 2 out. But generally, if you're putting a in to find this y value, you would go, okay, well, what's f at a? You know, if I put 1 into this machine right here, 1 squared is 1, add 1 more, I get 2. Okay, so I'm using the function to find the y value. Now, the second point. Let's imagine that there's some other point way up here. And if I put it here, just some sort of weird random spot like that, then I'm not really going to get the slope of the tangent line. You know, the tangent line is going to be something like that. That's what I'm shooting for. And I'm going to say, well, you know, take your time. Let's find the slope of this line, right? This secant line that connects like this. And it's okay to say, hey, I'm disappointed by that. It's not going to be the slope of the tangent line. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get to the slope of a line down there, right? Well, that, it'll come. Oh, just let me change the color here. I'm trying to get to this, this green one. Yeah, we'll get there. If we can bring that one little point back, okay, we're going to try to slide it close to the red point. So in a minute, we're going to take the algebra and say, go this way, and then see what happens. Well, that second point... It's going to be a little farther down the road. We're going to need to kind of name the x value for that. And then we'll find the y value by just going to the function and seeing what we get. And so Newton, when he was doing this, said, well, why don't, why don't I call this other point just a little farther down the road? Just hardly any move at all down the road. And so we're going to use an h. I don't know why it's h. Maybe it stands for hardly anything. So just hardly any move to the right. And then this point would be a plus the h, right? It's the original x value, and then hardly any little bit more. And if I want to know what the y value is, the only way I can tell this, and it's quite awkward, but I have to go to the function and then insert that x value in, a plus h. I want to try to find the slope of that blue line. That's my plan. So for this blue line here, the slope, it would just be y2 minus y1 all on top of x2. I'm just shooting for this, right? Just what I learned in grade 10. Okay, well, let's think about how that'll look here. The second y value is f at a plus a little bit more, hardly anything at all, minus f at a. Now in the bottom, I'm going to have my two x values. The second one is a plus h, and then minus a. That's always going to just be h, if you think about it, right? The a's subtract, and you can just call it nothing but h. And so our plan is to slide those two points together. In other words, we want to head to the place where h is equal to 0. But if we try putting in h equals 0, the math just goes all silly. right? So maybe I'll put this in quotes, well, air quotes to save me here. If I have h equals 0, I get division by 0 in the bottom. But I'm going to be happy if I can just get incredibly close. Going back a page, that's what we did here when we went 1.05. So this would have been an h value of decimal 0, 0.5. Hardly any move at all from the 1. You get really close to looking at the answer, especially if you do this as a limit. Well, exactly if you do this as a limit. And so that's what Newton said. He said, why don't we take this, this calculation of slope and just let the h go to 0. So by making h go to 0 right here, we're just saying that the two points are going to come really, really close together. 
and that's going to be the exact slope at A. And there's a little notation for that. That's where we use this apostrophe. Right? And so if we were to write that there, that means the exact slope at x is equal to a. And it's pronounced f prime of a. It's a whole new, uh, new operation, this priming thing. It's finding the slope. And we can figure that out at x equals 1 if we want by putting 1 in for a. Now, there is another way that you can write this. You can say, well, why don't I call the second x value just a, and then I can bring the a close to the x. So this is a different alternative way of writing it. Some people like this a little bit more. Um, I generally don't use it so much. Um, it's, it's pretty much algebraically the same thing. Either way, you're doing this limit of a average slope calculation to come up with the instantaneous one. Now, Isaac Newton was one of the two co-inventors of calculus, and this limit is named after him. We call this Newton's limit. It's also often called the definition of the derivative. So a derivative is an exact slope calculation. Don't worry too much about this alternative definition. What they're doing here is they're saying, all right, how about, um, how about we make that second x value? They're just saying x could be equal to a plus h. Just a different way of writing it. OK, so we have a plan now where we can find exact slopes of graphs right? at one point, it's at any point people pick. Uh, let's try this out over page. <clears throat> so the derivative of a function at a point. This f with the little apostrophe and then the a, pronounced f prime of a. Okay, so this is the name given to the slope of the curve at a point. Can't emphasize this enough. We're at a single point here right now, Okay, this point where x is equal to a. We've got our formula. We have our definition of the derivative. Let's try this out. Okay, Let's see if we can find the exact slope of that graph at the point x is equal to 1. So there's just one point in here. We have done this question already, sort of, right? Going back two pages. I kind of think the answer is going to be 2, just from looking at that 2.05. But let's do this formally here, using this definition of the derivative. We'll do it, we'll do it twice, okay? using both descriptions for this derivative. OK, here we go. So I'm going to do a limit for this slope fraction. And the slope fraction that I'm going to take a look at, it's just a y2 minus a y1 on top of an x2 minus an x1. That's all that's happening in that part right there. That's all it is. So I'm going to do f at 1. Oops, try that again. f at 1 plus h. And then subtract off f at 1. Because they've told me to do this at the point x is equal to 1. And I'm going to divide all of that by just h. You know, if you go 1 plus h minus 1, it's just going to always be an h down in the bottom. Here's the trouble, though. You cannot look at the top and say, well, why don't I just do f at h? Won't that be the top? No, it's not. You have to put these two x values in separately. It's usually kind of a little algebraic grind. And then you can figure out what the difference between the y's is. Now, that alone won't work unless I do a limit as h goes to 0. You have to write that in, and you have to keep writing that in until you're done. If I make h equals to 0, I get division by 0, and it all falls apart. So I can't do direct substitution here. OK, I could put that 1 plus h and the 1 into the machine, into the f function. And I'm going to do that. And here's where it gets a little long. So I'm going to put 1 plus h in to this function right here. Okay, they're saying, oh yeah, f of x is x squared plus 1. Okay, maybe I'll just use some brackets for emphasis. Right here, I'm going to put 1 plus h in to the function, right into the hopper right there. And I'm going to end up with 1 plus h squared, then add one more, right? That's just this f of 1 plus h. Then subtract, and I'm just going to put the brackets on here, kind of for emphasis. Here is the other y value, okay, the 
first y value actually. I'm going to put just one in. I would have one squared plus one. All sitting on top of h. Do not let h be zero. You'll have lots of problems if you do, but you could do a limit as h heads to zero. Okay, it's time to start tidying just to see what happens. Going to have to foil out that top. This is, uh, this is the big challenge that shows up when you do these things called derivatives. So you're going to have to often do this substitution and it slows you down. So I'm going to have, maybe I'll still keep using my brackets here for emphasis. I'm going to have when I do my foiling a 1 plus a 2h plus an h squared plus a 1. There, that's my second y value. And now subtract, here comes my first y value. It's going to be 1 plus 1, all sitting on top of h. And you cannot put h to be 0 because you'd get division by 0, but you could do a limit as h goes to 0. That slides the two points together. Okay, so in the top, we're going to tidy this up a little bit. There's some stuff that cancels. Uh, 1 plus 1 is 2. Subtract 2. Okay, the 1's all go away, but there's going to be a 2h plus h squared. All sitting on top of just an h. Okay, limit as h goes to 0. Yeah, don't put 0 in for h. That'll be a big problem. But you could try doing a little limit here by doing some factoring. So if I factor the top, I'll have an h that can come out, GCF factoring, 2 plus h, all sitting on top of an h, and I'm doing a limit as h goes to 0. Okay, as long as you promise not to put 0 in for h, as long as you're only going to put numbers in that are close, a little above or a little below 0, then those will never be 0 and you can cancel them off. They won't affect the value of this, uh, this expression. And now I'm looking at just 2 plus h. That one, I could do direct substitution. Okay, so if I'm doing this limit, h is going to 0 for the expression 2 plus h. Yeah, done. Direct substitution now, the answer is going to be 2. We were kind of guessing that it was going to be 2, just what we saw from what we saw a couple of pages ago. And indeed, it's exactly 2. Now, the other, uh, the other notation. Okay, some people like the alternative definition. Let's try it out. It, it, I'll tell you right now, it's going to give you an answer of 2 also, but let's just make sure that it does. Okay, so there's a little guide here for how to do the alternative. Yeah, all right, it's going to be a limit. It's basically the same thing. It's a grade 10 slope calculation, but people have brought the two points together. So x is going to be my second point, and we're going to let it collapse back down and get close to the first x value of 1. So my second x value is x, my first x value is a 1. I'm going to have to do f of x and then subtract f of 1. It's still just a, a y2 minus a y1 all on top of an x2 minus an x1. You, you really want to get comfortable with the idea that that's all that these things are doing, just this. You know, from when you first learned about doing slope, that's all we're doing here, except we're bringing the two x values remarkably close together. Okay, well, what happens when we do this? Um, let's check here. x is heading towards 1. If I do f of x, well, geez, that's right here. That's just x squared plus 1. Great, done. And then I would have to subtract off f of 1. That would be 1 squared plus 1. There's my numerator. And then the denominator, x minus 1. Okay, so if I do a little simplifying here, this thing starts to unravel. I still have to keep writing the word limit. If you don't, it's wrong. And as I tidy the top up, it actually tidies pretty nicely here. We're going to have just x squared minus 1 all sitting on top of x minus 1. And yeah, you don't want to put 1 in for x. That would be very bad. But it, it does factor. 
Right, you can factor that top. Still have to keep writing the word limit. Top factors x minus 1, x plus 1. All on top of x minus 1. Okay, as long as you're promising to be close to 1 but not equal to 1, those two numbers are not equal to 0. They're very small and they're going to go away. Their effect on that expression goes away. And so we really just have this limit to do. What's the value of this expression when x heads towards 1, when you're playing around with x plus 1? Oh, okay, direct substitution works great. The answer is going to be 2. So just a different way of getting to the same spot. So that's how you can find the exact slope of a graph at a point just by doing this thing called Newton's limit. And now we're going to try that out with a few different um, other functions, a few different other points, and we'll see if we can find equations of tangent lines as well. So number three it says, can you find the instantaneous rate of change? Notice that, right, instantaneous and one point at the point x equals 3. It's not going to be between two points. That's an average rate of change. This request can be written just this way, f prime of 3. That's what they want to know. What is the exact slope at 3? We're going to do it by doing a limit of a little grade 10 slope calculation. So I would set this up as the limit as h heads to 0 my two x values. You know, if you think about this, we've got my graph, one x value is going to be 3, and the other one is just a little farther down the road, 3 plus h. So I want to do, for my slope fraction, f at 3 plus h, that's the second y value, minus f at 3, all sitting on top of just a plain old h. You know, I guess in the bottom we should be writing 3 plus h minus 3, but that's always just going to be an h. Okay, we'll keep on going. I do have to keep writing the word limit over and over and over. It's expected that it'll be there. Putting 3 plus h into this machine, into right here, I'm going to have 3 plus h get squared, then add 1. Putting just a 3 in to that machine, I would have a 3 squared plus 1. Be careful with your order of operations, though. Right? It's supposed to be that answer minus this answer. It's especially the second part that we have to make sure we think about a big bracket on that because it's led by that subtraction and then just an H down on the bottom. Okay, doing a limit as H goes to zero. Let's see how much room we've got here. Oh, yeah, we've got lots of room. We're good. Okay, it's time to do the algebra. I'm going to do some foiling here. Those two, there are two binomials side by side, right? It's like it's like this, three plus h bumped into another three plus h. So I'm going to have a nine, a six h, an h squared, plus a one, minus a nine, and minus a one, all sitting on top of h. You know, it's no accident that all of the constant stuff goes away, right? Like nine minus nine and 1 minus 1. If that doesn't happen, you've got something mistaken going on in there because we need to be able to do some uh, factoring here, some GCF factoring in order for this thing to actually work. H is heading to 0. Okay, so what's left? A little factoring, the H comes out. We've got a 6 plus H all sitting on top of an H. Now, as long as you're promising to put in numbers that are only really close to 0, those won't affect the answer, but I still have to do this limit now, which I'm going to do by direct substitution of 6 plus h. So you put 0 in for h, and you go, ah, the exact slope, the perfect tangent line slope is 6. And example 4 follows up on that. It says, well, can you find the equation of the tangent line to that graph at x equals 3? Well, I'm just going to go back a couple of pages and show you what we now know just from that answer coming up as 6. Okay, actually, I'm going to go back one more page. It's a bit cleaner. So here's my function, and we just found that if you draw in a tangent line at x is equal to 3, that tangent line would go in here. That tangent line has to have a slope of exactly 6. 
And now they're asking us in example four, can you go and find the equation of that orange line, the equation of that straight line? Sure. I know the slope is six, and I even know a point that's on it, okay, this point 310. Uh, so let's, let's try that out. This is a very, very common request that you then go and use that information about the derivative value, the exact slope, to find an equation of a tangent line. So a quick little sketch. I don't need a lot of time here. All right, I've got my graph. And there's this point 3. And the y value is actually a 10. Right? You would just use the function to find that. Right? Just put 3 in. 3 squared is 9. Add 1 is 10. And we're going to try to find the slope of a tangent line that looks like that. Sorry, to find the equation of the tangent line. We know that the slope is exactly equal to 6. Okay, so this goes back to the very first day of the course. Um, if you're trying to find the equation of a line, then you need a couple of things. You're going to need a slope. Got it. And you're going to need a point. I've got it. I've got the slope to be 6 for that orange line, and I know a point that's on the orange line. It's the point that you're touching the graph at. So if the graph has a point 310, so does that orange line. So the slope is 6, and the point is going to be 310. Now back to the first day of the course. Let's imagine there's some other point way out here. We're going to call it x, y, and we're going to say, hey, if you find the slope, it better work out to be 6. So you would go y minus 10. That's the difference in the y values between the orange and the green point all sitting on top of x minus 3. That's the difference in x values between the orange and the green point. You have got to be 6. And you have to rearrange this a little bit. You can't leave a binomial down on the bottom. If you put that into a graphing program, it'll almost look like the tangent line, but it'll have a point missing. So we have to write this as y minus 10 is equal to 6 times x minus 3. Now, if you wanted to put that into your graphing calculator, You'll have to write it explicitly as a y equals, if you move the 10. Um, but the first one is going to be your go-to answer. Don't move it unless you have to, to graph it. If they just say, hey, what's the equation? Let's stop right here. Less chance of making a mistake. And it's a perfectly valid way of talking about the equation of that tangent line. Okay, let's try that out again. Next story here. Uh, number five. Can you find the equation of the normal line? Oh. That's a bit awkward. Um, calculus doesn't like to do that. Calculus is great for tangent lines. Um, so worth a little note here. Calc only does tangent lines. So we'll have to intervene there a little bit. So I need to have a, a point and a slope. Uh, the point I can find just by putting 9 into the, the function, looks like the root of 9 will be a 3, but I need the slope. So this is going to be a, a bit of work to do, but I think we can pull it off. Um, F prime figured out at 9. What is the exact slope at 9? Well, it's going to be a limit as h goes to 0, and it's just a grade 10 slope calculation. So I'm going to put in uh, 9 plus h, and put in 9 and see what happens. So when I put in 9 plus h, right, this would be the square root 9 plus h. So if you're wondering, whoa, what, what, is, what is that all about? Okay, where did that come from? That right there, that's me finding f at 9 plus h, the second x value. And then I have to subtract off. It's going to be the square root of 9, which, yes, is just a 3. And if you're wondering, whoa, whoa where, where's that coming from? That's me just doing f at 9. And that's all going to sit on top of an h. And you cannot do direct substitution. If you try putting 0 in for h, you get division by 0. It's actually a 0 on the top and a 0 on the bottom. And it's not clear at all what that's going to be. So we need to find a way to do this limit. But that limit can be done using conjugates. I'm going to take this numerator and I'm going to give it a little kick with its conjugate square root of 9 plus h, don't change anything inside the root, but change that subtraction to being a plus, okay, plus root 9. I know root 9 is the same thing as 3. I'm just leaving it there so it kind of looks nice, looks the same. 
and I'm going to multiply the bottom by the exact same thing. I don't want to change the value of this answer. All right. So let's keep going. Let's see if we can find this slope value. So this is called f prime of 9. It's the exact slope of the graph at 9 for x. Doing the limit as that hardly anything at all number goes to 0. OK, the beauty of the conjugate. When you do the foiling, the firsts, the root times the root, well, the root signs go away, and you end up with 9 plus h, like a nice, honest 9 plus h, no root. Then the outsides and insides are identical. That's why we do the conjugate. Don't have to worry about them. But then minus the lasts. Root 9 times root 9 is going to be a 9. So you have subtract 9. All sitting on top of this bottom. Okay, This bottom is going to be h multiplied by that stuff. Don't, don't actually multiply it out. Just leave it for now. Right? I know you're supposed to distribute. But for now, just say, yeah, I'll get to it. And it turns out we'll never get to it. And the reason is, look how nicely the top cleans up. In this particular question, f prime at 9, we're going to be doing a limit as h goes to 0. Well, 9 minus 9, those just go away. Right? Don't even have any constants left. And I'm going to have, for my numerator, nothing but an h sitting on top of this h. And then this other stuff, which I said I would multiply eventually. Eh, maybe. Maybe not. Okay, well, as long as you're promising to put in numbers that are close to 0 for h and not actually 0, you might as well cancel these off. Just put a 1 up here. Now I can do direct substitution. And you might be thinking, no, 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 that, that binomial down there will have a problem when h is 0. No, not anymore. It's got a plus, not a minus, like we had originally. So this will, uh, this will be totally fine. We can actually do our direct substitution now and find out what the exact slope of the graph is at 9. That's what that means, f apostrophe 9. It's pronounced f prime of 9. OK, putting 0 in. I'll have a 1. 0 root 9 is a 3 and a 3. 2 3's add to a 6, uh, 1 sixth. OK, be careful, though. Calculus is telling you that the slope of the tangent line is equal to 1 sixth. You don't want the tangent line. You want the normal line. So we're going to have to spin that around. The normal line slope will be the opposite reciprocal. So it'll be a negative and a 6, actually. So the, the graph would look something like this. We don't have to draw a graph to finish this question off, but it, it's helpful just for us to get comfortable with what's going on. Root x looks like that. And there's this point out here, 9 over, 3 up. And the tangent line is very shallow. It looks like that. The slope for this thing, oh, kind of went funny there. The slope for this thing is 1 sixth. And they're saying, well, yeah, but can you find the line that's normal to it? Normal in math and in science means perpendicular. Okay, it's got to meet at a 90 degree angle to it. It's got to punch right into it, like the normal force in physics that's perpendicular to the ground. So I've got my tangent line. I've got my normal line here. And it has a slope of negative 6 in contrast to the tangent line that has a slope of 1 6. So normal just means perpendicular to the graph. It's perpendicular to the black curve. OK, well, I have my point, 9, 3. And I've got my slope for my normal line of negative 6. I'm ready to go. Finding the equation of this, I would pick another point out here, call it x, y, and do my usual game. y minus 3 on top of x minus 6 is equal to negative 6. You can't leave it like that. You do have to move the binomial in the bottom to the other side. It's not a line until you do. But you can and should leave it like this. Don't do any more work. Oops, sorry, I got a wrong number in there. Don't do any more work with this than you need to. 
if I'm allowed to stop right there, then I'm going to stop right there. That's the equation of the line that's normal to the graph at that point. It, it touches the graph at, <clears throat> at 90 degrees. So I mentioned just a minute ago how normal force in physics is perpendicular to the ground, and our normal line is perpendicular to the graph. Uh, so often we're going to see physics examples show up. Here's one right here where we talk about the distance, or if you wish, displacement a rock has fallen, is given by this function 4.9t squared. So if you're in physics class, you might, you might say, oh, well, I thought it was like 1 half at squared, right? Sure, yeah. You know what? 1 half of 9.8, that's 4.9. So if you just drop it and don't throw it, sure, the displacement it falls is 4.9 t squared. And we're going to try to find some velocities. Well, velocities are actually just slopes of displacement graphs. Right? That's all they are in physics. So if you imagine a little graph here of, hey, how much displacement have you fallen down with your rock? And here's time. It is quadratic. That's the way rocks fall. They, they don't move much at the beginning, but then they start really changing their position fast and they have big displacements and we're going to do an average slope calculation for part A and then we're going to do the same rock again but we're going to do an instantaneous story for part B. Okay so part A says can you find the average velocity that's just a slope okay from the time 3 to 5 so right here's 3 there's 5 and we're going to pick two points and say well let's on average find out what the slope is between those two points. So my average velocity, my average rate of change is going to be this. It's just a y2 minus a y1 on top of an x2 minus an x1. So to find the y values I would go to the function, it's right here, about 4.9 times 5 squared minus 4.9 times 3 squared. There, y2 minus y1. I'm just using the function divided by the x values. Well, t values, I guess, for this physics question. 5 minus 3. I'll save you a little bit of time. You can try that on your calculator. It ends up being 39.2. The units, if displacement is measured in meters and if time is measured in seconds, then this would be a slope. So it would be meters per second. But now part B says, hey, that's, that's nice. You found the average from 3 to 5. But what is it doing exactly at 3 seconds? What if you were to go here and say just at 3? Well, then you'd be trying to find the slope of a tangent line if you wanted an instantaneous velocity. And you could say, yeah, the, the notation for that. You could say, I need to know the velocity right at 3. Or if you wish, the slope of the displacement graph figured out right at 3. So I have to do a limit. I've got to do a limit as h goes to 0. h is going to be how far extra down the road I go when I go to find my second point. And my limit would look something kind of like this. Okay, I'm going to put in my second point, which is going to be 3 plus h. So I would have 4.9 times 3 plus h squared, and then minus 4.9, 3 squared. So I have two different times. One time is 3, and the other one is hardly anything more than 3. And then I'll divide by the jump in time. Okay, I've got to foil that all out. Okay, it's a bit of a mess, but I think I can make this happen. I don't know if I'll have enough room, but I think I can get this to work. Okay, I'm going to hang on to that 4.9 for later. Foiling out this binomial, I'll have a 9 plus a 6h plus an h squared, and then minus 4.9 times a 9, all on top of an h. Well, there's actually a, a little canceling that happens. The 4.9 times the 9 is going to reduce with the 4.9 times 9. So that's all gone, and that's gone. And I end up with just this limit. I'm trying to avoid grabbing my calculator. I'm going to have a 4.9 kind of hanging around here. I can extract an h, and then I would have 6 plus h, all sitting on top of h. It's 
So I just have these two terms left, right? Just factoring the h out of them. Oh, as long as you're going to be close to zero and not actually zero, you can go and cancel the a these h's. So the h, if you're wondering, what is it talking about? It's how much farther down the road you go before you pick up your next point and say, yeah, my other point will be here. Right? And I'm just doing a grade 10 slope calculation, moving hardly anything at all down the road. And then taking that hardly anything at all h value and sliding it towards zero. Okay, now I can do direct substitution, and the answer ends up being just 4.9 times uh, this 6 plus the h. Uh, this is going to end up being uh, 29.4 meters per second. A little shallower than that steeper line up above. All right, we're going to do one more page uh, for this lesson. And on this next page, um, eventually, very soon, you're going to see very fast ways to do this. So I'm going to suggest today that when you're trying questions out like this, don't torture yourself. Feel free to use your graphing calculator to help you sketch the curve. And then we can go, <clears throat> excuse me, go and figure out what's happening with the slope at the point they're talking about. So they're saying determine if the following curves have tangent lines. Do they have derivatives at the points indicated? And then sketch the curve to support your answer. Uh, so yeah, definitely just let your calculator help you out here. This is a function by piece. We're going to do one graph up until this box, you know, up until x is equal to 1. We're going to graph 1 over x. Okay, so if I graph that, the graph actually goes kind of kind of like this, like swooping down like that. And then it comes out of the sky, and it gets to the point 1, 1. You can do this on your graphing calculator. And you are allowed to graph the point at 1, so I can put a solid circle in there. Great. That's the first branch. Now, the second branch, right? What about the other part? Okay. I do this. Let's just pull this to the front and hide that. I can do this next part when x's are past 1. I can graph the line x plus 1. So x plus 1 is just a straight line slope of 1 with a y-intercept of 1. Uh, I just don't want to graph it the whole time, right? I don't want to do something kind of like this. Can't draw it all the time. I have to draw it after x is equal to 1. So that's, that's no good. But I could say, all right, starting here and continuing, I can do that. And I'm not even allowed to graph it at x is equal to 1. This thing is definitely a function. You know, it's a function by piece. It's a bit awkward, but it's definitely a function. If I was to do a vertical line test, it absolutely passes the vertical line test. It never, it never is trying to be in two places at once. Like even right here, it's at the point y equals 1. And then we're on the yellow line after that. So no worries about it failing the vertical line test. And so they're saying, okay, can you see if it has a tangent line right at this one point? So they're wondering about this point here. This is the point they're given, okay? At the points indicated, and they're saying tangent line? You know, is there a tangent line there? In other words, is there a derivative there? They're asking, you know, is, is it possible to ask the question, hey, what's the slope of the tangent line right at 1? Does it exist? And the answer is no. Like, look, this thing's not continuous. So if it's not continuous, it cannot have a tangent line. Uh, and that's worth putting a note in, absolutely for sure. So if at that point this graph is not continuous, then there's no way it can have a tangent line. So tangent line slopes are called derivatives, and this thing has no tangent line slope, so you could say it's not differentiable. Okay, That's kind of the interesting word. If your graph is not continuous, then it is for sure not going to be differentiable. In fact, let me say this. If you've got a graph that's not continuous, it is never differentiable at that point. So differentiable is an adjective. It says it is derivativeable. I could find the slope if I did a limit. You'll never get that limit to work because of that skip, that jump in the function, that discontinuity. Okay, the next one, we're going to check out what happens at the transition, which occurs at x is equal to 2. So at the beginning, I only want to be thinking about 
you know, this top graph, and I'm going to be thinking about it up until 2, right? I'm allowed to graph that parabola until there. Then I'll switch gears and draw the other one. And it'll be a function. It won't fail the vertical line test. So I draw my parabola. You can use your calculator if you want to see how this parabola goes. It's going to look something kind of like, oh, what do we have here? Yeah, roughly like this. And it actually comes up to this point 2, 2, and it even equals that point. That's the first branch. Now the second one. It's a line. Y-intercept is 4, slope of negative 1. So you can line your ruler up with that Y-intercept, but don't, don't draw it back here, right? It's not allowed to be drawn back there. You can only draw it after the blue one. And it does have a slope of minus 1, so it's going to end up looking... Oh, let's see how this is going to go here. I get my ruler right. Something kind of like that. And it actually kind of connects, kind of like a trailer behind a truck. Maybe not a straight line, but it does actually connect. Okay, and so people are asking you, they're saying, can you check this out at x is equal to 2? We're kind of wondering, is there a tangent line there? Is it differentiable there? And the answer is no. I, I wouldn't know how to draw a tangent line in, you know, like, how would you draw it? So at that point, if that's the one place you want to talk about, and they force me to talk about it because they've got it right there, you could say, well, let me tell you that at x is equal to 2, it's pretty impressive because it's continuous. Okay, I'll give you that. But unfortunately, it's not smooth. So we would say it's not differentiable. So it's connected, but not smooth. No tangent line there, no derivative value there. The last one, again, don't beat yourself up. Use your graphing calculator to draw these things out if you want. And you can see exactly what their shape looks like. The first part, 3x plus 2, it's got a slope of 3, a y-intercept of 2. And we're going to graph that thing up until negative 1. Now that ends up kind of terminating right here at negative 1, negative 1. And they've actually said, let's put the dot in there for that. Then the next part is a parabola, and it begins after negative 1. I'm going to save you some time right now and tell you that not only does it touch it, but it even connects in a smooth way. So this blue line has a slope of 3, and then right as the parabola kind of kicks into gear here, it actually has a slope of 3 as well instantaneously, and then it becomes the nice curved parabola shape. So it connects, and it even connects smoothly. And you might ask, well, how do I know that it's smooth? I'll show you that in just a second. But if they're going to say, hey, can you talk about what you see happening right there at that point, if they force you to talk about that section, you can say, well, let me tell you about it. Let me throw you some adjectives uh, you know, at this graph here. This thing is continuous at that point and differentiable. Okay, two last things as we finish up this, uh, this page here. First of all, how would you be able to know that it's actually smooth, that the two graphs touch each other, both with a slope of 3? You could do this. Okay, it's kind of a graphing calculator skill, and you can try this out. I'm going to put these graphs in. I'll just do them one at a time. So I put my first one in as if I didn't know what the slope of 3x plus 2 is. Oh, let's put it in. 3x plus 2. Great. Zoom. 4. Okay, so there's the line, and if I ever wanted to calculate values, I can. I go second, calculate a value, please. Number one, hey, what's the value when x is negative 1? And it says, well, the point is negative 1, negative 1. But I can even ask my graphing calculator to find the slope as well. Now, it's going to be 3, but here's how you do it. You go second, calculate, and it's this option here, number 6. And we'll see the notation next day, but it's number 6. And I wish they had programmed the calculator so that once you press 6, it would actually say to you, hey, type in the x value, because it, it really should. So right now, just type in the x value. Just go in, hey, at negative 1, please. And as soon as you start typing the number, it says, oh, yeah, x equals. And you hit enter, and it'll say, okay, the slope, that's the notation, is 3. That's the derivative value. So yeah, the line has a slope of 3. Yeah, like we didn't know that. Okay, let's put the other graph in. Get that one out. Put in negative x squared plus x 
plus 1. Just graph that. I want to see what its slope is. Well, for one thing, the y value is correct. It is negative 1. But I could say, hey, can you calculate a slope? It's option number 6. And again, I wish it would, it would be saying to you right now, please type in the x value. I have to go negative 1. And then I hit enter, and it says, oh, the slope for that is 3 right there. So yes, it, it's a smooth connection from the blue graph to the green graph. That's what differentiable means, right? So in layman's terms, in, in everyday language, this means connected, and this means smooth. Now, you can be connected and not be smooth. We saw that on the middle graph. Okay, it was connected but not smooth. Um, the top one is not connected nor smooth. And the bottom one's got it all. It, it's smooth as well as being connected. It is impossible to be smooth and unconnected. So I like to throw a little kind of silly biology at this uh, just for you to get a feeling for what's going on. Um, down here, this last one that has everything, this is like saying, hey, this is an animal. And I can tell you more, and it's a cat. So in order to be smooth, you have to first be connected. In order to be a cat, you have to first be an animal. This one up here, well, it's got the connected thing, but it's not smooth. So this is like saying, yeah, this one is an animal, but not a cat. And the top one? The top one's not even connected, so it's, it's not even an animal. Okay, this one up here, this is neither an animal nor a cat. Now, I kind of joke about the whole cat-animal thing because of this issue. It is not possible to be an animal sorry, to be a cat and not be an animal. In other words, you will never have a graph that is smooth but disconnected. It can't happen. If it's going to be differentiable, it has to first at least be continuous. So you cannot ever draw a graph at a point that is discontinuous but somehow differentiable. It just, it just doesn't happen. And that finishes up our first day. Um, again, we've been talking about derivatives at points. We've been picking a point and then focusing on what the, the slope is at that point. And you'll notice next day as we finish up the notebooklet, we're going to make it way more general and say, well, let's not lock ourselves into one point. Let's keep it really broad. And that'll be our last lesson.